Good evening, and welcome to the MTA's second town hall about the Interborough Express. My name is Sean Fitzpatrick. I'm Deputy Chief of Staff for MTA Construction and Development. The Interborough Express, or IBX as we call it, is a proposed transit project that would connect Brooklyn and Queens. It uses an existing, underused freight line that runs from Bay Ridge in Brooklyn to Jackson Heights in Queens. Uh, this past January, Governor Hochul directed the MTA to commence an environmental review of the project. To, and since that announcement, we've taken that in stride and started engaging with stakeholders and doing engineering analysis. This included our first town hall, which you may have joined back in May of this year. Since that first town hall, the IBX team has been hard at work advancing the engineering analysis to help us better understand the constraints and come up with solutions to ensure that we are advancing the best project possible. We've also reviewed the hundreds of public comments we've received, both at that first town hall and in the months since. Tonight, Mike Schiffer, Senior Vice President for Regional Planning at MTA Construction and Development, will give a presentation that describes the project in more detail and describes also the work that we've done in the past few months. Following the presentation, we'll answer your questions. To ask a question, use the Q&A function on Zoom. We we'll, won't be able to get to every question tonight, but we'll try to cover the major themes, and we'll be updating the Frequently Asked Questions page on our website, new.mta.info slash IBX, uh, when we, uh, in, in the follow-up to tonight's meeting. Although we've made significant progress since our town hall, I do want to stress that we are still very much at the beginning of this process. The, we are engaging much earlier than is always the case with capital projects of this nature, and we think that the project is going to be stronger for it. Uh, so we're very excited that you're with us tonight. We look forward to continuing engagement in the months to come. And with that, let me introduce Mike Schiffer. Mike, as I said, is Senior Vice President for Regional Planning here at MTA Construction and Development. He has extensive experience in transportation planning, both in academia and with transit systems across North America, and he's been leading the planning effort on this project. Mike will give a presentation, and then he'll answer your questions. Mike? Thanks, Sean. It's always a thrill for me to present this project to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Interborough Express Corridor for those of you who weren't at our previous meetings. Um, I'll also then review what we've learned from a feasibility study we conducted in recent years. Um, and I'll describe our current efforts at identifying a preferred transit mode for the corridor. Finally, we'll discuss the path forward. Um, so in terms of the context of, of the uh, uh, corridor, um, basically um, the Interborough Express would provide a transformative new transit connection between Brooklyn and Queens. It, it connects, uh, the corridor connects right through the center of those two very populated boroughs uh, and it will facilitate mobility uh, throughout the area. Uh, it will be built along an existing little-used freight corridor that runs from Bay Ridge uh, in Brooklyn to Jackson Heights in Queens while preserving uh, both existing and potential freight service in that corridor. MTA is continuing uh, to study the feasibility of the project as we prepare for an environmental review and future project stages. Now, the corridor has been there for a long time. Uh, passenger service started back in 76, that's 1876, um, as part of the New York and Manhattan Beach Railway. Here you can see a couple of images of the same platform taken almost 100 years apart. Uh, we probably won't reuse that specific platform, but you can see uh, that there are the remnants of passenger service along this part of the corridor. Passenger service on the line ceased in 1924, and it's currently uh, still serves as one of the few freight lines that connects this area of the region as well as Long Island and by extension through uh, car ferry uh, to uh, New Jersey and the rest of the United States, a freight car ferry, I should say. Um, the northern portion of the corridor is owned uh, by CSX, uh, the freight railroad. That's the upper three miles of the corridor. In the southern 11 miles is owned by uh, the Long Island Railroad as part of the MTA, uh, and it's operated by the New York and Atlantic Railway for local freight service. Currently, it serves about uh, three freight trains, one to three freight trains a day. 
Um, in terms of the context uh, of the area, demographically, uh, the study area, which is defined as a half mile on either, either side of, of the rail line, uh, is incredibly diverse. Uh, there's nearly a million people uh, living within a half mile of this line and more than a quarter million jobs, and those are expected to grow in the coming years. Uh, the corridor's non-white population is about 70 percent, and nearly half of the residents in the corridor uh, don't own a car either by choice or by necessity. As you can see in the map on the right, uh, many people in Brooklyn and Queens uh, not only travel to Manhattan, but they also travel within their home boroughs. And this really helps getting across and between those two boroughs. Uh, as well as it connects up to 17 subway lines, so it facilitates mobility into Manhattan and into the rest of, of the region. Um, there's significant ridership demand as well. It would address uh, the needs of a lot of folks, uh, carry up to about 80,000 weekday trips, uh, depending on the mode that's chosen, and as I said, it would connect up to 17 subway lines and I should mention the Long Island Railroad as well. Now there's many examples of how people can save time with the Interborough Express. In this case, a person who's traveling from Flushing to Brooklyn College can save almost a half hour uh, by avoiding a circuitous trip through Manhattan. That's almost an hour every day, which adds up to a lot over time. And there's many other examples, as you can imagine, of origins and destinations that can be made shorter uh, by using the Interborough Express. The expectation also is that these uh, transit vehicles would operate as frequently as every five minutes. So it's, it's a potential very robust transit service. Now, I should point out that we're working very closely with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. They're undertaking an environmental impact assessment uh, of uh, upgraded freight in that corridor as well as a cross-harbor freight tunnel. Uh, so right now they're entering into what you would call a Tier 2 environmental impact statement. Uh, and basically, we work very closely with them because we recognize the need uh, to facilitate freight mobility for the economic health of the region, both now and in the future. And to this end, uh, we're working to make sure that uh, whatever mode, transit mode we land on doesn't preclude uh, either existing or future freight, and they're working very hard with us to make sure that their uh, goals don't preclude transit in the corridor as well. So we're working closely to make sure that these options are compatible with one another. In terms of the feasibility study uh, which was conducted, we started with a lot of different transit modes uh, basically and narrowed it down to three alternatives, which is where we're at today. Uh, we looked at automated guideway, we looked at subway. Uh, they were eliminated due to the fact that they required significant property uh, along the corridor. Um, and it, it's worth noting that we don't own all of the air rights above the corridor, so we're kind of limited with what we can operate uh, in that area. We also looked at uh, suitability uh, as well of stations, station locations uh, along there also, and uh, landed on the three alternatives that we've been undertaking uh, more detailed planning and design with over recent months. Uh, the three alternatives that we've been looking at uh, have included conventional rail, light rail, and bus rapid transit. Uh, conventional rail is, is really a, a lot like what you might be familiar with uh, if you ride the subway or if you ride Long Island Railroad or Metro North. It's a, a, an electrically powered train uh, that basically gets its power from a third rail typically. Um, and uh, the difference between this train, say, and a conventional commuter rail train is that it would have fewer seats and more doors because it would make more frequent stops. We would expect people to be riding on this, um, you know, maybe five or seven minutes at a time. They're, they're not on it for long periods. And so there, it would operate much like a subway. And in fact, in some cases, it would be indistinguishable uh, from a subway car in, in certain contexts. Um, 
There's examples, of course, of where uh, conventional rail has been uh, adjusted, if you will, to match uh, the needs of an urban uh, level of service uh, in other parts of the world. One notable example is London Overground, which you see in the center image uh, below. Light rail transit um, is basically uh, something that's become very popular around the world. Uh, you don't have to go very far to experience it. A simple trip to Hoboken, New Jersey uh, will take you to the Hudson Bergen light rail line uh, and you can see it there. There's other examples of light rail uh, in cities throughout the world in North America. For example, Toronto in the upper right uh, operates long articulated streetcars uh, in mixed traffic as well as on reserved lanes and various streets in the city. And you see examples of this in other parts of the U.S. as well, uh, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, Philadelphia, Boston, etc. These vehicles offer a greater degree of flexibility in some respects than conventional rail because they don't have a third rail power. They get their power from either overhead uh, wire or uh, they get their power from storage batteries. And so that means that they can operate in mixed traffic environments in a variety of urban settings as well as on their own reserved railway uh, or in tunnels. So they have a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, in that respect. Finally, bus rapid transit is distinguished from the select bus service that you might be familiar with that MTA operates now on reserved lanes. Uh, bus rapid transit in this context, the bus would operate not just on a reserved lane, but on its own private roadway along this alignment. And so it would operate a lot more like a light rail vehicle or a conventional rail train. Uh, the difference is really that a bus rapid transit vehicle uh, is a little shorter uh, than a train, so you don't have the ability to expand with ridership as you would with the other rail opportunities. Um, that said, you can see examples of bus rapid transit uh, nearby, including Hartford, Connecticut, and other parts of the country uh, as well, and they can be very, very uh, viable options. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about where that brings us. We've looked at these three options and we've looked at some of their constraints uh, as well. Uh, first of all, I should point out that we began our public outreach in early 2022, including the last town hall meeting we had like this on May 19th. We provided information on, on the status uh, of where the project is and uh, we also um, received significant feedback from the public, from elected officials, and from our partners in other levels of government uh, to understand the implications of, of the different modes. We performed a further evaluation of each mode, including the potential uh, engineering and environmental issues along the corridor, and did a deeper review of some uh, conceptual design specifics. Um, and so what that did is it got us into developing what we call planning and environmental linkages study, which is basically a study that's aimed at determining a locally preferred alternative. Um, we received a, a variety of public comments as well. Uh, we received over 600 public comments in fact, on the project website. And one of the things we asked you to do is drop a pin on a map where you thought a station would be, where you thought a good spot for a station would be. And no surprise, actually, uh, a lot of folks chose intersections with subway lines or intersections with major arterials, which is exactly what a transportation planner would choose for station locations. Uh, the number of stations has yet to be determined and the specific locations or constraints of specific stations uh, still needs to be determined as well. But we're well on the way uh, towards identifying those station locations. We also heard a few other things from you. We heard uh, a definite preference for rail over bus, and we heard about concern over grade crossings. As you might remember from the last presentation, we had a, a, a model for uh, bus rapid transit and light rail to operate almost at the surface level in certain stations where it would basically, the freight would be in an open cut and the light rail would come out of the cut 
uh, or bus rapid transit and intersect the streets uh, very directly uh, with signalization. Um, we developed a way to address that concern, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. We also heard uh, folks say that, of course, they want to connect to existing MTA services, and that's what this project is all about. Um, and so uh, we're looking at ways to facilitate that connection. And finally, we heard about concern. Uh, concern was expressed uh, in particular about existing and in, in future freight operations. And uh, we've taken those concerns and we've passed them along to the appropriate folks who are either operating the existing services or who are planning future freight services. So in terms of this in planning and environmental linkages study, which is what we're doing right now, uh, basically to advance the project, we're conducting this. And the purpose is to identify potential issues along the corridor, advance conceptual design uh, of all three transit modes to identify strengths and weaknesses uh, of each of these, and determine the transit mode that best meets the objectives uh, of, of the overall project. Um, and so uh, basically, uh, what, once this study is concluded, we expect to land on a preferred mode, and we expect that to happen uh, in the next month or so, or six weeks as, as we move forward. So we identified as part of this planning and environmental linkages study three key challenges. Uh, one was a challenge to traffic impacts and the reliability of the transit service. Uh, another challenge was the East New York Tunnel. That's that hundred and, actually it's almost 150 years old now, uh, that tunnel I showed at the beginning of the presentation uh, in East New York. Um, and it's about three quarters of a mile long. Um, and we identified some challenges in the vicinity of the All Faith Cemetery near Metropolitan Avenue by the terminal of the M subway. So in terms of traffic impacts and, and reliability, um, as I mentioned just a little while ago, bus rapid transit and light rail, uh, if they were operating at street traffic, it would make, uh, at street level rather, it would make their operations less reliable and it would also impact, of course, uh, the crossing traffic as well. We've determined that through engineering modification, we can actually lower bus rapid transit or light rail into the open cut uh, where the freight exists, moving the freight tracks to the side uh, and actually operate both side by side. And by doing this, we can eliminate up to uh, 24 grade crossings in Brooklyn. Um, also, in a light rail option, we could fit light rail into the cut in Queens and uh, eliminate uh, any intersection with Roosevelt Avenue there. Bus rapid transit, however, uh, would still need to uh, join Roosevelt Avenue in Queens to be able to turn the buses. Buses, the, re the reason for that is buses are single-ended, uh, and so they need to turn around, uh, whereas uh, most of the rail vehicles, of course, are double-ended, so they can just stop on the tracks in reverse direction. Um, the East New York Tunnel is another engineering constraint that we identified. As I mentioned, it, it's over 125 years old, and it's fairly narrow in spots. Um, conventional rail uh, cars, like Metro North or Long Island cars, are too wide to work safely in that tunnel because of the third rail, uh, they would require a platform for people to exit the train in an emergency, and there's not enough room for the platform and the train itself there. However, uh, specialized narrower rail equipment can be obtained, uh, and that could operate in the tunnel successfully. There's examples of smaller footprint rail cars that are FRA compliant, Federal Railroad Administration compliant. Uh, for example, uh, the Port Authority on their PATH services operates uh, those kinds of cars as well, and they're FRA compliant. So you can have different types of rail cars that are smaller that operate in that, in that tunnel. 
Uh, light rail, standard light rail vehicles can fit in that tunnel without modification because uh, people would exit closer to the ground and there's sufficient room for people to exit into uh, an adjacent tunnel in an emergency. Uh, but bus rapid transit would require specialized buses with special guideways, if you will, to enable the bus to safely operate in the narrow confines of the tunnel, as well as special signaling so that the bus could operate in a manner so people could exit into the uh, adjacent tunnel. The buses would have to operate on the left rather than the right through the tunnel. So that, that's a, a potential constraint also. Finally, um, in the vicinity of Metropolitan Avenue, uh, there is a freight tunnel that goes under the All Faith Cemetery that's operated by CSX. There's unfortunately no room for transit in that tunnel, and so if we were going to operate conventional rail, third rail powered rail cars through that area, they would need a new tunnel to be built there. It's a significant cost uh, and risk, I might add. Um, alternatively, light rail and bus rapid transit could operate either in a tunnel such as that, or they can operate at street level uh, through streets in that vicinity. Of course, that requires a significant amount of traffic engineering, it requires a significant amount of design, signalization, and so forth, but it's done successfully in many other cities. So, just to summarize what we found, first of all, we have not yet selected a mode as a locally preferred alternative yet. Uh, we're conducting further analysis, and we've certainly uh, identified some advantages and disadvantages of these three modes. Uh, to summarize, uh, conventional rail would require specialized vehicles to safely operate in the East New York Tunnel, those narrower rail vehicles. Uh, and it would also require the construction of a new tunnel under Metropolitan Avenue near that cemetery. Light rail could operate uh, in the cut with freight. It would require some special uh, detection, intrusion detection, and barrier walls to operate so close to freight operation, but it is feasible uh, to do that. Uh, so it provides a significant amount of flexibility there. Bus rapid transit can fit in the cut as well. It would require, again, that intrusion detection. It requires a little more width and space. Um, and it would require some significant operational and design modifications to operate in the East New York Tunnel. The other challenge with bus rapid transit, as I mentioned earlier, is you'd have to turn the buses at the terminals. And while that might not necessarily be a problem in the vicinity of the Brooklyn Army Terminal at the bottom end of this alignment, near the top end, um, near Roosevelt and Jackson Heights, uh, there's significant traffic uh, already existing on those arterials, and so having the buses operate that frequently there could be very problematic. So, where does this take us? Well, we're nearing completion of uh, this part of the study, which is the Planning and Environmental Linkages Study, and we expect to be selecting a preferred alternative later this fall. We wanted to give uh, you an updated sense of our thinking uh, and another opportunity to provide feedback and input before a final decision is made. I should point out that on this diagram here, uh, we've completed uh, the project details which we reviewed with you earlier. Um, we're finalizing the study uh, that looks at the implications of these three modes. And then we would undertake a formal environmental review process starting early next year. And that would also include formal public engagement as well through that period. Uh, from that, uh, we would then incorporate this into what we call our comparative evaluation of projects for, as we consider our, the future of our MTA capital programs, we're looking at not only this, but about two dozen other projects throughout the region, and to look at how they measure up relative to ridership, cost, equity, 
uh, resiliency, and a variety of other factors. And we would look at those factors in an apples to apples comparison and determine how these projects stack up relative to one another and determine whether there is even uh, room in the capital program as we contemplate uh, future expansion and enhancement of our network. I should point out that uh, the, the primary job of the capital program is to maintain a state of good repair for MTA. And so over 80% of the current capital program is aimed at doing that. However, we recognize that there's always a need to look to the future. And we're looking at projects that enhance capacity. We're looking at projects that enhance mobility. We're looking at projects that enhance resiliency, et cetera. And we're looking at these through the lens of the new world that we're living in right now in terms of how work, travel, ridership, and other patterns have changed uh, in, in the new uh, situation that we all find ourselves in. So with that, um, if all went well and if we were able to secure funding after uh, the two-year environmental review process, which would begin early next year, we would embark on uh, design, engineering, and potentially construction. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sean, who can talk a little bit about our outreach. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. So, you know, this is a continuous public engagement process. As Mike alluded to on the last slide, you know, we would plan to enter public review, enter environmental review in the first quarter of next year. And that would mean that we enter a sort of formal public engagement process that many of you on the, on the call may be familiar with, you know, kind of with formal hearings and a formal process. So we would uh, enter that next year. We're out here early to sort of make sure that public engagement and public feedback is shaping the project really from the start. So we haven't, as Mike said, made a decision on what mode to take. Um, but we're reaching the end of this stage of the process. And so we thought it was appropriate to check back in with the public, update you on our findings, update you on the feedback we've received so far, um, and give another opportunity for folks to make their voice heard. So both in the Q&A chat of this, uh, this Zoom webinar, as well as on our comment page at new.mta.info slash IBX. There's still time to get, the, get your voice uh, in and make sure that your comments are heard as part of this process. Um, so with that, I think we will turn to the public engagement of tonight, which is to say answering your questions. And so thank you for, for your comments, Mike, and let me now ask some questions. As noted, uh, please put um, any questions that you have in the question and answer box uh, in the Zoom, and we'll run through questions we received in advance now. So I, I want to start, Mike, with a few questions that we've received um, related, related to sort of what you talked about at the end, sort of where we are in the process. So we haven't selected a mode yet, as we said. What is the remaining work to do as we reach a locally preferred alternative? So we're taking a final look at the various engineering constraints uh, along the alignment. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at some of those key areas that I identified uh, to determine, you know, what our capacity is to, to overcome uh, the constraints that have been identified. Uh, we're also uh, looking to develop a greater understanding of the best locations for stations. Uh, for that, we look forward to your continued feedback. Uh, and of course, we need to understand the implications of rebuilding a lot of these bridges uh, along the line, uh, constructing stations, and all that adds up to cost. Uh, and the cost is, is differentiated depending on the mode. We don't know the final costs yet. We're still putting a lot of that together as we uh, develop a, a general understanding of, of relative costs of, of these operations. Um, and so for that, then we'll uh, get to a point where we can provide uh, greater feedback to the public about uh, the options that we have. Thank you, Mike. So that, that speaks to sort of where we are in the IBX process. You also mentioned that this project fits within the larger comparative evaluation process that's taking place as part of the MTA's next 20-year needs assessment. Can you tell me a little bit more about what comparative evaluation is and where the IBX fits in it? 
Sure. Well, uh, comparative valuation is part of our overall capital planning process here at MTA. Uh, we undertake a capital plan every five years. Uh, the next capital plan will be for 2025 to 2029. And as part of that capital plan, we develop a 20-year needs assessment. And that assessment really looks at where we need to invest to, number one, keep our existing system operating effectively. But also, it offers the opportunity to consider potential growth opportunities for our network or how we can enhance our network using uh, a variety of, of different proposals that have been made, really. And so we're looking at these proposals in a comparative manner where we're looking at, number one, uh, how many riders are attracted to these, either new riders or diverted riders from, from other services? Uh, what does it do for existing capacity constraints uh, in uh, the city and in the region? Um, we also look at uh, what are the costs associated with constructing these, and we're reevaluating costs of all of the projects that have been proposed through the past few years so we can use consistent metrics uh, and assumptions on those. And we look at equity as well. We look at where uh, the projects will bring the greatest value to people who need to derive that value in terms of people who are in communities that might have not have been as effectively served as they should have been. So we're looking at, at the entire region. We're also looking at um, resiliency and a variety of other things. And the results of that comparative evaluation, uh, which we'll, we'll get a better handle on over the next year or so, will then feed into that 20-year needs analysis and then potentially into future capital programs should funding be available. So how does this project, uh, where does this project land in that context? Is it getting sort of a leg up on the 20-year needs assessment? No, I think, you know, what, what happened was when we looked at this uh, initially, uh, it certainly caught our eye and a lot of other folks as well uh, attention because it has so much potential with respect to the ridership estimates as well as uh, the potential for serving diverse communities. And it provides a, a mobility option. It's not just a capacity enhancement. It really lends itself to how people may be changing their travel patterns. All that said, we will still look at it through the lens of all the other projects, but we anticipate that it will perform very effectively. Thanks, and, and you talked a little bit about sort of, you know, that we don't yet have a cost estimate. Uh, it is a question we get a lot. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of what, what we think the project might cost and sort of when we will get to a phase where we are able to talk about it more? Well, we know it's going to be a multi-billion dollar project. That, that we can say. Um, we don't know exactly how much we'll get a better sense of that uh, in the coming weeks and or in the coming months rather. Uh, and as we get greater definition about some of the constraints, you'll have a better idea of how that how that plays out. So we're looking at that very carefully. Thanks, Mike. So when, let me talk a little bit now about some questions we've gotten re related to the sort of challenges that you identified and the, and the refinements that we've come up with. When we spoke in May, you mentioned and you talked about tonight how portions of the bus rapid transit and light rail were initially intended or at least uh, conceptualized as running at street level for a significant portion of Brooklyn um, where sort of the, the right of way was considered too narrow. Now we've identified an engineering solution that would allow them to run at uh, the same level as the freight. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of how we reached that uh, new design and sort of what its implications are? Sure. Well, I think, you know, a couple things. First of all, um, in much of the area where the uh, alignment is, is very constrained, basically the walls of the uh, it, it's in a cut, it's in an open cut in kind of a, a, a valley, if you will, and the walls kind of slope down to where the tracks are. By instead rebuilding it and carving out that slope so that it's more of a straight U shape, you can fit the additional tracks or lanes in that cut. So that, that's one point. The other point is, of course, it requires a certain amount of separation from freight uh, through various regulations and guidelines. 
and uh, through intrusion detection and through effective uh, barrier walls at key locations, we believe that we can operate in, uh, it, within that constraint. Uh, it, it does add some cost to it, especially carving out that, uh, that section, uh, but we thought that given the benefit of taking it off of the street, uh, that far outweighed uh, some of the, the engineering challenges. That said, this is not a trivial project, certainly, from a, a design and engineering perspective. Thanks, Mike. Uh, to talk about the next of the challenges you identified, you know, the East New York Tunnel, almost 150 years old. W you know, what were the issues that we, can you elaborate on the issues that we ran into and sort of how we've been able to address them? Sure. I think, you know, one of the key things with the East New York Tunnel is, first of all, uh, there was an assessment made that, that is structurally sound. That's, that's the important thing. But also, uh, there was an early look at safety in, in, in that tunnel as well. And so we had to look at how people could evacuate from trains in that tunnel effectively. And what that typically means uh, is creating uh, an egress point to an adjacent tunnel and appropriate doors that could uh, allow for that and appropriate platforms. And so as we looked at that, it became very clear that a conventional rail car had to be narrower than your typical Long Island Railroad or Metro North car. It had to be uh, a size that's almost indistinguishable from a New York subway car uh, and more like a, a path car that operates uh, by the Port Authority. Um, and so uh, that's what you would have to do with a conventional rail option. With bus, um, you would need to be able to evacuate into the adjacent tunnel, and because the doors are typically on one side of, of a bus, uh, you could either operate an adjacent tunnel or you would need specialized buses with doors on the left and right. Uh, but you would also need for bus special guideways uh, to enable the bus to operate safely through the tunnel so it doesn't basically uh, run into the walls. And, and so there's a variety of mechanisms that would need to be put into place to, to address that. And light rail, uh, as I mentioned earlier, could operate through the tunnel because of the configuration of the rail cars. You're, you're exiting close to the ground, uh, so you have, and you have doors on both sides already on your standard light rail vehicles. Thank you, Mike. So to close out the, the other challenge that we identified, um, can you talk a little bit more about what the current setup is at Metropolitan Avenue? There's currently a tunnel, is that right? Yes. There, there's a tunnel that CSX operates that goes under the cemetery there. It's a very short tunnel. Um, and uh, what we are looking at, if it's a conventional rail option, we would need to, if we were going to continue north past Metropolitan Avenue, need to get the train into a tunnel prior to that. It would go through a deep tunnel underneath uh, Fresh Pond Yard, uh, which is a rail yard, under the, the cemetery and then come up on the other side. Uh, with a potential station at Metropolitan Avenue itself. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty costly proposition, but we're, we're looking into it and looking into uh, what, what that involves for conventional rail. With light rail and bus rapid transit, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can operate in a tunnel uh, there if you construct that tunnel, as I mentioned, but you could also operate uh, in the street environment uh, as well. It's not ideal, but it's done in a variety of other cities. It requires uh, special lanes, it requires special signals, uh, and it's something that we would be working with the city and the community on determining how, how viable that would be. Another question that we've gotten tonight is sort of about the fare of the program and sort of, so what would the fare be and sort of what integration would there be with existing New York City transit services? So the whole point of this is to connect the subway lines, connect the rail lines, uh, and in order to do that, and you're connecting bus lines and arterials as well throughout Brooklyn and Queens. And so the point of that would be to um, integrate the fares. Um, it, the fares are, are generally the responsibility of the MTA board, but we would expect these fares uh, to be comparable to 
a subway fare, probably the same subway fare, and you could use the Omni card uh, or something uh, like the Omni card in the future, but probably the Omni card. We think it'll have a lot of staying power, um, and uh, that would enable you to uh, basically uh, transfer from the subway uh, to the Interborough Express and then back to another subway or a bus and so forth seamlessly. So we would expect the fare to be integrated uh, in that manner. Also, that helps facilitate transfers where you can't, you know, there's some areas along the alignment where it's just physically not possible to connect, say, a subway platform to the Interborough Express platform directly, but with the OmniCard or with the future fare media, you could do a short walk, what we would call an out-of-system transfer, and still be able to connect. Another question that has come up quite a bit is about the accessibility of the, of the system. Um, so sort of would this project be ADA accessible? What sort of accessibility features would be included? Of course. Uh, all the new projects that we construct are ADA accessible. Uh, so we would make sure that all the stations would be uh, accessible, uh, whether it's by ramp or by elevator. It really depends on the context and specific location of the station itself, whether it's elevated, whether it's at grade, or whether it's under, under grade. And, and you hit, I think, a, a really key point there, Mike, which is that any new project that the MTA constructs is sort of as a matter of course um, made fully ADA accessible. So that's true of this project, but it's not just true of this project. Um, it would be true of any of the projects, uh, expansion projects that are under consideration. Um, so I, I think a, a related question sort of speaks to, and you may be able to speak to this, maybe I can add some, um, sort of what design we're looking at for, I know we haven't picked the stations yet, but we got a question about sort of how will the stations sort of fit into the neighborhoods where we're looking to build them and sort of what opportunities are there to make sure that there's sort of transit oriented development or that it, you know, sort of fits in the neighborhood. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, sort of this well, stage think, of the process? I think there's a lot of attention being paid to being contextually you know, uh, develop contextual plans that, that fit within the context of a specific neighborhood. Um, it's a little too early to say exactly what that looks like. A lot of it comes down to the very local level. Uh, we certainly have a very active TOD group here at MTA, as well as others who would be working with the city, uh, the appropriate departments of the city of New York as well. Uh, to determine kind of what the features would be at a station to have it fit and, and weave effectively into the neighborhood that it serves. Absolutely. I mean, I do think that we conceptualize that this project has the potential that these stations would be new cornerstones of neighborhoods all across Brooklyn and Queens. And so certainly would, as we you know, continue to encourage folks to suggest station locations at new.mta.info slash IBX. Uh, that's new.mta.info slash IBX. Um, and also, you know, uh, you know, a as the process continues, you know, there will be substantial public feedback as we um, think about what these stations could look like and how they can help connect um, communities across Brooklyn and Queens. Um, Another question that we've gotten is how frequent would the proposed service be? So we would anticipate that in the peak period, uh, the vehicles would run as frequently as every five minutes. Uh, in the off-peak, they'd be more like every 10 to 15 minutes, basically very comparable to the existing subway service that we operate now. So a related question to the, you know, kind of how the project will fit in with the community is how it will connect to other um, non-automobile related modes of transportation. What thought have we given to pedestrian and bicycle uh, connections for the new project? Well, I, obviously I think we want to make sure that people can access it uh, as effectively as they possibly can. And so this offers a new opportunity. Here you're designing stations from scratch, basically. Uh, and so as you develop new stations, new transit stations, uh, you want to take advantage of the various sustainable modes that people can use to get to them. And what that effectively means is walking, is accessing via a bicycle. Uh, it means accessing uh, for people with disabilities, and it means transferring uh, from other transit services as well. 
that's going to be different depending on the context in which the station is located. So, uh, but there are opportunities throughout uh, for for facilitating that kind of connection so that you can effectively travel that first last mile, if you will, of your trip. Great. I, I think uh, another sort of key question that sort of to zoom out for a second, can you talk a little bit about what the, you know, why, you know, a lot of our subway system is focused on getting folks into Manhattan. What is the value of having a project like this that um, focuses on the outer boroughs? Well, I think what, what it does is it, it addresses an, a key need, which is that um, although Manhattan is always going to be absolutely critical to the region and, and to the city, um, it's also very important where a lot of people who live in the region work in other areas of the region than the central business district. And what this does is it facilitates that movement across the region very effectively. And so that's really, really important because um, it's traditionally very difficult to get across the boroughs of New York uh, as well as to get between the boroughs of New York. Uh, and so this offers a much faster opportunity and, and a greater level of accessibility for so many people uh, in that respect. It also provides the ability to um, just connect uh, to new opportunities, to new jobs, uh, as well as provides a connection for people to take uh, what we would call discretionary trips, trips for shopping, uh, which aren't always discretionary, or trips to see friends and, and so forth. And so it, it really provides a different type of travel. And it also provides greater access to the central business district for people who live between subway lines, who can then connect to those subway lines using this new service. Right. I think it is a very meaningful, um, meaningful move for the city to be thinking about and for the MTA to be thinking about sort of a, a change on the sort of traditional um, model of providing rapid transit, and it's exciting to be part of thinking that process through. Um, I guess, you know, to that end, though, we do get questions about why the project terminates in Queens at Jackson Heights, and, you know, previous iterations considered um, extension all the way into the Bronx. Why does the project, as we've conceived it, sort of end where it does in the northern portion? So, first of all, um, we looked at what it would take to bring it further up into the Bronx. And the good news for the Bronx is we've got a new service that's well ahead of this in the pipeline, and it's Penn Station Access. It will provide four new stations in the Bronx uh, at uh, Co-op City, Morris Park, uh, Park Chester, Van Nest, uh, and Hunts Point Terminal. Um, and so the people who live near those stations will have access to, to Manhattan via what's called Amtrak's Hellgate Line, uh, which is the line that Amtrak uses to get from Penn Station up to, uh, up to the New Haven Line and points beyond. And so the Bronx has access both with those four stations uh, to Manhattan as well as reverse commute options in Westchester, Connecticut, and, and beyond. But by doing that, we'll have Metro North on that line we also have Amtrak, who owns that line, operating two tracks. You'll have the new Metro North stations, and you have CSX, who has freight operating rights on that line as well. So that corridor is completely occupied by existing services. So as much as we would love to extend this along that corridor, uh, it, it's already you know, well prescribed in terms of uh, existing services. That said, uh, there's always opportunities for effective connections as we look at how we're connecting this uh, to other services at uh, either both ends of the line as well as the stations along the way. That makes sense, Mike. So I, I think another question that's come up is what the line is currently used for and sort of how our project would affect it. I think that you've mentioned that it's sort of a little used freight line with a few, you know, up to a few trains a day. Sort of what are those, what, you know, a lot of people live in this, in the corridor may not realize that they live next to an active freight line. Um, you know, sort of what is the existing service 
uh, in Brooklyn and especially, I guess, in Brooklyn as well as in Queens? Um, and sort of how does our project affect it? So um, I can say a little bit about it. Right now, uh, the New York and Atlantic Railway operates a freight service along the line. And basically, uh, there are rail cars that come across uh, by barge uh, from New Jersey uh, to the area in the vicinity of the Brooklyn Army Terminal, just south of there. Uh, and they're transferred to trains. There's also trains uh, that uh, connect uh, to points north and to points east out on, on Long Island as well. And so this line itself helps to transfer cars from that float service, if you will, uh, to uh, a yard uh, in the vicinity of Fresh Pond, uh, where the cars are then transferred for onward movement to parts of Long Island or up uh, to other areas of, of the region along the Hudson Valley or up uh, along the New Haven line and other places like that. They also uh, provide service to several local uh, industrial customers uh, along the line. Uh, and so those services might be, uh, you know, a, a few times a week or, or sometimes even less frequently. Uh, cars would be dropped off or picked up at some of the industrial uh, facilities uh, along the line right now. Uh, the trains run at, at all times, uh, frequently at night, so even if you're relatively close, you might not see it. It's under, it's again in this depressed cut, so it's not always that apparent. And the whole point of this project, though, is to maintain the ability to uh, continue goods movement for the region, uh, both now and in the future. Thanks, Mike. I'll take this moment now to note we're you know, approaching the end of our hour here this evening. We do have a little bit of time left to run through a few more questions. Um, but I just want to note again that um, thank everyone for putting questions in that has. Um, continue to put questions into the Q&A box here um, or visit new.mta.info slash IBX. And we will um, you know, continue to take feedback into account kind of through the last few minutes of this meeting and, and sort of well into the, um, well into the, um, you know, well into the future of the process. So uh, the next question I want to get is one that we get a lot. Is sort of, do we know what amount of private property acquisition may be necessary for this project? So the good news is the project would be built along an existing corridor. Uh, so um, there's already an existing right-of-way that MTA owns. Uh, part of it is uh, with um, uh, CSX as well, and we're uh, working with our partners there to determine how we could operate uh, in, a, a, in a way uh, along that corridor as well. Uh, so that's the good news. There's already existing uh, right-of-way. Uh, and that means that you have relatively little in the way of additional property needs should you construct the project. Uh, we would work very hard to maintain uh, the ability to construct the project entirely within uh, our ownership envelope, if you will, uh, but there may be certain cases where uh, there may be some adjacencies where you would need to acquire property through appropriate mechanisms. Uh, that said, it's a little too early to tell uh, because we're not at that level of design. So we have to go through it to determine kind of uh, what the opportunities and needs would be. So just to summarize that, and you can tell me if I have it right, one of the attractive things about this project is the fact that it isn't, you know, a lot of the right of way is already owned by the MTA and is already used for railroad purposes. Um, you know, there may be the need for um, easements or acquisitions along the margins, but sort of this project compared to, you know, trying to carve out a new right, rail right of way through the heart of Brooklyn and Queens um, is at a significant leg up and would have a significantly less uh, meaningful impact um, on sort of the need for property acquisition. Is that about right? Yes. Great. Uh, another question that we get a lot is um, sort of what the construction impact would be. You know, this is, a, this is a line that runs through a lot of, you know, very densely populated residential neighborhoods. 
what do we think the, you know, how would, what would the construction impact look like and, you know, how would we try to mitigate, um, you know, any negative effects on residents? Well, I think over the years, MTA has learned a lot about uh, construction impacts and how to mitigate that uh, to the best of their abilities. Um, it's really a little early to understand what specific impacts there would be until we get to a more final design of this project. But suffice it to say, there's a number of mechanisms that uh, MTA puts into place uh, to help mitigate the impact uh, of construction on, on neighboring properties and so forth. And of course, uh, MTA would work very closely with the communities uh, to help to uh, maintain uh, and facilitate uh, that engagement so as to minimize uh, any negative impact. Certainly, this is, this is an example where the fact that we are out here so early you know, will only help us, you know, build relationships across the entire corridor and, you know, be prepared to work through potential issues, you know, if and when we're able to work through toward a construction phase uh, of the project. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions that speak to uh, kind of understanding the modes and sort of some of the complications on the modes that um, you talked about tonight a little bit better. The first is to ask, sort of how would the BRT bus be different than current SBS service? And I, I think that may be asking both about sort of the model of service as well as sort of the bus itself. Well, um, the service and, and, and the bus would be different in that it would be in its own dedicated roadway, right? So uh, unlike existing SBS, which shares the road with all sorts of traffic, pedestrians, deliveries, et cetera, this would be on its own dedicated roadway because it would be down with, with the freight lines and so forth. So therefore it would have much fewer opportunities for kind of um, uh, disruption, if you will. Uh, it would operate more smoothly in that respect. Uh, the vehicles themselves would be very similar to, to uh, typical buses except for the fact uh, that they would require, again, uh, some special gear on them uh, so that they could safely operate uh, in a relatively narrow tunnel. Um, and uh, quite possibly they might need uh, doors on an opposite side or special signaling through the tunnel to facilitate uh, any, any necessary evacuation that might be required in an emergency. So that said, um, there are examples of bus rapid transit vehicles around the country uh, that are somewhat specialized uh, as well. Thanks. And, a, and a, a similar question we got related to vehicles for conventional rail. The question is, would the MTA need to procure new conventional rail cars for IBX, or could we use the existing fleet in some way? Well, I think the expectation is that, well, first of all, you'd, you'd need to procure new rail cars because it's a new service and the, the current fleet is already uh, being utilized. Uh, but that said, um, also, if it's conventional rail, as I mentioned, you need a narrower rail car than, say, a standard uh, Long Island or Metro North rail car. It would be more akin to the smaller subway cars that New York City Transit operates uh, and probably uh, very similar to the vehicles that the, new, uh, that the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey operates on their path services. Those rail vehicles have additional uh, strengthening uh, as required by the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, they also have some additional modifications for signaling uh, and for hardware on the outsides of the rail vehicles, the ability to dim their headlights, and, and a variety of other uh, modifications. But they're very, very similar to, say, uh, a conventional subway car uh, in other respects. But the bottom line is whether it's conventional rail, light rail, or bus rapid transit, you would still need to procure uh, a new fleet to be able to meet the demand of this new service. And as we approach the end of our town hall tonight, I want to ask uh, what I think is probably a logical final question. What, can you summarize again, what are the next steps for this project? Sort of what, what would it take uh, you know, over the course of the next few months to see the project advance and ultimately, you know, how do we get towards construction? So over the next few months, uh, we're going to uh, bring to closure this planning and environmental linkages study, which is going to determine what's the most appropriate transit mode for the corridor. 
Um, we will then uh, embark on uh, a NEPA, what's called a NEPA review, or basically an environmental uh, study, if you will, a formal environmental study uh, that's a federally sanctioned study uh, that would determine kind of more detail about the implications of this mode and of this line and any mitigations necessary along the entire route. Uh, and in addition to that, there's uh, a level of uh, design and engineering that would take place. So the study, the environmental study, would probably uh, embark, uh, we'd embark on that in early uh, 2023, uh, as well as additional engineering uh, feasibility that would be embarked upon uh, throughout that. And the environmental study is typically a two-year-long study. If that goes well, and if you have a, um, you know, a green light, if you will, from the federal government, uh, then you can get into uh, the design uh, engineering and, and construction, the final design engineering and construction of the project. But of course, all that depends on money. Um, and uh, although a funding source has not been identified for this project, we're not precluding any funding sources. We're doing what we need to do to be able to make sure that it qualifies for uh, the various pots of money that we could uh, potentially uh, uh, tap into to enable this to, to operate. But of course, this has to be looked at in the context of, again, MTA's overall capital needs as well as uh, the regional priorities. Thank you, Mike. I think that's a, a great place for us to end tonight. We are at at time, but I think this has been another very informative session uh, with a you know, lot of updates for folks to chew on and, and give us feedback on by going to new.mta.info slash IBX, the comment portal, the ability to put um, pins on potential station locations is still up and will be up for the next few weeks um, as we you know, reach the end of this particular stage of the public engagement process. So let me thank the project team, everyone here at the MTA who helped to make this uh, event possible. Um, and let me thank you, Mike, for answering questions. And I, my final thank you, let me thank you, the, the viewer. Um, you know, again, we're, we're out here early on this project, and we think that that is an incredible strength um, based on the quality of the feedback and questions that we got tonight and that we've gotten over the last few months and I'm sure will continue over the course of the months and years to come. So thank you very much for tuning in and you know we will very much be in touch uh, as this project continues to advance. Thank you all. Thank you.